If you are just joining us, you're very welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're joining us from. You're very welcome to this uh, Marathon Spotlight event, uh, which is taking us on a 13 hour journey around the globe. Uh, today, as people around the world are celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, uh, we're taking the opportunity to celebrate our own fantastic community of women scientists who are leading uh, the way in a wide range of research and scientific innovation. They're breaking barriers, they're finding new ways to advance the transformation of food, land and water systems in a climate crisis. Uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Fiona Farrell. I lead CGIOR's function that works to advance gender equity, diversity and inclusion, or GDI for short, in our global workplaces. Uh, we in the GDI function, we just recently celebrated our very first birthday. Uh, we were launched in late January 2020, and we have a very clear mission, which is to work with leadership, management and staff across CGIOR uh, to make sure that our workplaces are truly enabling and inclusive for our over 10,000 people. Our goal is to ensure that diversity in all its dimensions is embraced and that every person in our workforce is, is really supported uh, to reach their full potential. For us, this is not only the right thing to do, it's really the smart thing to do. Uh, we know that uh, diversity can bring the different perspectives and the, and the great innovation we really need to deliver on our critical mission. Uh, the work of the GDI function is guided by CDIOR's GDI framework and action plan. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about these important documents or about our knowledge hub uh, or our guides or our GDI matrix, which is what we use to hold us accountable for delivery on the goals we've set, you can learn much more by going to our GDI webpage and you can see the details on the screen right now. Among the many initiatives uh, that we've had the honour of supporting in 2020 uh, has been the launch of a new employee-led resource group called WIRES, Women in Research and Science. And WIRES brings together all those in the global community uh, who are seeking to support our incredible women scientists, providing them with a supportive, safe place uh, to meet, to learn, to grow, to advance. Now, today's event follows on closely from the official launch of WIRES on the 21st of January. And we're recognizing the significant contribution of women scientists by showcasing a sample of their exciting and innovative work. So as we're getting ready to continue our 13 hour journey, we remind you of a few housekeeping rules, please. Uh, you can see them on the screen. Um, we invite you to submit your questions and your comments via the Q&A box uh, and to reach out to Thomas, please, if you have any technical difficulties. Uh, we also invite you to join WIRES using the contact details on the right hand side of the slide. It is now my very great pleasure to welcome the speakers for our third Power Hour, which is being hosted by our IMI colleagues, handing right over to you now. Hi there. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome uh, to our power hour. Um, absolute pleasure to catch the uh, previous sessions. They've been incredible. Um, and I can guarantee that ours will be just as uh, inspirational and uh, motivational um, as Iris, which was just wonderful. Um, so I want to invite you uh, to uh, join us um, where I'm honored to be. My name's Ellie Ross. I work at IMI. Um, and I'm honoured to be joined by five absolutely brilliant, um, uh, prodigious scientists, researchers, uh, thinkers. Um, but first of all, uh, before we get on to uh, our informal conversation, which will form the bulk of our power hour, and please do ask questions throughout, uh, I want to pass you over to our uh, Director General, Mark Smith, who has a few words to say before we get started. Um, so let me pass you over to him. And again, uh, just to remind you, please do stay on mute. Uh, any questions, pop them in the Q&A below or in the chat and I'll keep an eye on them. And my assistant Inga will be telling me and giving me a wave whenever we've got something coming in. Uh, so don't worry, I won't miss it. Um, but over to you, Mark. And thanks very much for joining us.
I'm assuming Mark is here. Otherwise, I'm going to have to pretend to be Mark, and that could be a, an uncomfortable 10 minutes. Hello. Hi. You, <laughs> sorry, my, my um, Zoom was just jumping around, but now I have, uh, uh, I'm able to unmute. So um, thank you, and good to be with you all. Um, so I want to add my welcome to this IMI segment of this uh, worldwide event, this really impressive worldwide event, and uh, to thank thank uh, Wires and the organizers for um, for the opportunity to contribute my my comments and thoughts. Um, yes, and to really start by congratulating the the ERG, the Wires ERG. Um, for, for your inspiration and the effort that you're making in bringing together all of the centers in what's really an amazing format uh, with what I've seen are really excellent and interesting programs for each and varied programs for each of the sessions. Um, and of course, there is very important business to be done today uh, and to be done throughout today um, and including in this IMI led session because we're here to mark the International Day of Women and Girls in Science and to discuss the importance of and our shared commitment to uh, equality, and um, equality and equal opportunity in the workplace and indeed in the, in the mission that brings us all to work every day. Um, in reflecting on what I wanted to say today, I realized that a good place for me to start would be to recognize some of the really extraordinary women leaders that I've had the privilege to work with and for over, over the last many years, and to speak a little bit about the impact that they've had on me and my career, and some of the things that their example has taught me. Because I, I have, as, I, as I've worked through that, I realized that, that I really have been privileged to work with a collection of really amazing uh, leaders who happen to be women. One of those is Claudia Sadoff, who is well known, of course, in the CGIR, who I've, um, she's been a mentor for me over many, many years, going beyond CGIR as well. Um, uh, also, Julia Martin Lefebvre, who's a former director general of IUCN when I was there and now board chair of, of the Alliance. Inger Anderson, also a former director general of IUCN and, and now executive director of UNEP. Uh, Siri Sendashonga, who is a global director and a colleague at IUCN, and I think also XC4. And then going back a long way, 20 years in, in my career, to a really extraordinary character named Sheridan Morris, who was a science leader at CSIRO in Australia when I worked there. Um, and as I say, it, it, these are, this is an, I realize this is an amazing collection. I'm sure many of those names uh, are, are known to many of you uh, of women that I've, that I've worked for. And all of them have been really significant mentors at different points in, in my career and in relation to different things, but there's really no exaggeration to say that they've had really profound impacts on my professional life and, and on my own approach to leadership. Um, their example taught me many things, including uh, certainly the example of their commitment to equality and inclusion and to being purposeful in confronting barriers to women's equality at work and in promoting women's success and careers and that doing that means working on it every day and, and, and across all aspects of the work that we do. Well, today, of course, is a day that we get to celebrate and we celebrate International, the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Uh, and we celebrate the achievements of female researchers across the CGIR. Um, but also as we do that, as a community, we, we will be sharing stories. We are, we will be sharing stories and learning from those stories about new and better ways to promote inclusion and equal opportunity. Um, historically, of course, we acknowledge that in the sciences, um, as well as other sectors clearly, but in the sciences, women have been less represented than men. And there's no doubt that we can see the legacy of that in the CGIR to this day. Um, but this is slowly changing and in the CG and in IMI, uh, and we're committed to being part of, of this change, including through the example that we heard Fiona speak about, the, the framework and action plan for GDI in the CGIR. Now, it can seem, of course, a bit of a cliche that um, to say that diversity makes our work stronger, but I think uh, that in IMI, we have experience in recent years that has shown that there is real wisdom behind those words. So um, just a quick anecdote then, over the course of 2018 and 2019, we went through a restructuring in IMI that led to a 
really substantial renewal of, of our leadership team so that now today we have out of 24 people making up our management and research leadership group at IMI, 12 of those are women. Um, and alongside that, in that group, there's, a, there's also a, a really rich uh, cultural diversity. And so we experience the benefits of this diversity every day in, in IMI um, and leaving me personally as now the Director General at IMI with really no doubt that diversity makes IMI stronger as an organization, as well as I'm also convinced a more creative and more inspiring and, and a more impactful place to work. Um, now, over the course of that period, 2018 and 2019, I learned the importance of having robust processes in place for making sure that the best talent has access to opportunities, regardless of gender or background. Uh, and that when we're very mindful of doing that, uh, it can work, we can make progress. But I know too that, there are, that there's more work to do, and perhaps especially in science, and even more especially in international science. So in international scientific organizations and institutions like ours. Um, and I, I really do believe, and I've heard lots of, I've had discussions with colleagues about this over the years, I really do believe that, that we need to challenge ourselves to understand whether there are and what those are, what are the particular barriers and hurdles that women face in finding career paths in the CGIR that will work for them and enable them to thrive and advance and contribute to the CGIR, both as researchers and as their careers proceed as leaders. Um, and and with, with that understanding will come the opportunity to put in place uh, support mechanisms and policy changes and so on that are needed to help overcome those things, which is of course where WIRES and this session hopefully comes in. Um, so I've seen some of the questions that are going to be uh, part of today's session um, and that they're going to explore um, uh, um, the, the questions, we have questions in today's session that's going to explore uh, what is going to, uh, sorry, I've lost my track here. Um, having seen some of the questions that today's session is going to explore, I think this is indeed going to be a really important opportunity um, for, to learn more about how we can do better in IMI and as CGIR and ensuring that, that women can thrive and succeed here as scientists and more broadly and for the, for the same reasons, I strongly support the WIRES ERG, and I see it as a really valuable initiative for promoting the achievements of women in CGIR, and therefore in the overall success for both men and women, of course, of CGIR. Um, so I'll close by encouraging everyone to participate in WIRES events and, and in the other activities that I know are being designed and prepared. Um, and the final, the, the final thing I'll say is that a great example that I know is, is being talked about is a mentoring initiative for WIRES, uh, which I would wholeheartedly adore, endorse, of course, because then others will be able to benefit from the, from the really rich and impactful mentoring that I've had the, the benefit of experience from those women leaders that I mentioned at the beginning of my re remarks. So I will wish everyone a great session now. Uh, and of course, throughout the 13 hours of, of this amazing day. Thank you. Back to you, Ellie. Thanks so much for that, Mark. Um, I really liked your take on the story of, of how women have inspired and supported you through your career. I think it was a really original uh, and great, great to hear. Um, right. So before we get on to the main discussion, um, where obviously we'll be discussing uh, women leading uh, with men, um, a water and food secure future in, in, a, in a COVID-19 world, um, we thought it would be a good opportunity to show you a little bit more about Imi's relationship and commitment uh, to water. So Inga, take it away. We have a video and it's coming. I hope it's coming because again, I don't think I can act out <laughs> the water secure uh, video uh, for 10 minutes. Amazing. I 
suppose we could each take a part and act out river, sea, and streams. <laughs> Sorry, Eddie. <laughs> I'm just trying to, to get it loaded here. No worries. Can I help it. at all? No, that's okay. I um Perhaps Ellie, I think let's let's start with the discussion and then we can have that, that afterwards. Great. It's okay. That's absolutely fine. We're all still it's never gonna be as good as in person. So we're we're all doing our best and I am going to really uh I'm just so excited to introduce you um to our uh participants um on the panel. Uh let me share my screen so you can see their brilliant um bios here we go i'm just going to share now um and yes there we go so um it's my honor uh and privilege to introduce you to our five speakers um today who will be sharing uh their backgrounds their stories their inspiration uh their hopes um and of course their incredible careers so we have maha al zubi uh gita shrestra tando bopella uh bekiwi uh, for Kutsi, apologies, uh, Khadija Begum. And I'm now going to uh, just get rid of my screen so you can see them. If you want any more information, uh, they're obviously all here and accessible in the Q&A, so just drop us questions. But uh, let's crack on and get started. So if you can all turn your cameras on, um, wonderful panellists, um, and then I can start. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, Let's crack on. So Maha, seeing as you popped up first on my screen, um, I want to start with you. Um, would you, <laughs> don't look so scared, it's all good. I just want to hear about your incredible career. And I, what I wanted to do first is ask you to tell me what you see as the highlights of your career so far. And um, what do you love about what you do? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Eli, and thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity to be part of this great uh, uh, marathon today. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, like uh, uh, highlight from uh, my career. Uh, first, I have a PhD degree in environmental uh, design from University of Calgary, uh, Canada. Uh, I have uh, over 18 years of professional experience in uh, strategic planning, designing and managing research. Uh, public and international funded programs uh, in various sectors, uh, uh, particularly uh, water, energy, agriculture, and environment. Uh, things I love, um, um, I have a long uh, standing interest in the interplay between uh, water, climate change, development, and policy, and uh, always uh, demonstrated commitment in supporting organizations uh, and initiatives that uh, strive to improve livelihood and protect uh, environment. Sorry, I mute myself. Uh, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, Gita, I'm over to you for the same question. Uh, I'd love to know about your career highlights and, and just give me a quick, as Maha did so excellently, uh, what brings you from the start to here? Tell me about what, what you've done that you've loved. Gita is on mute. Sorry. Thanks, Ali, for the question. And I would also like to uh, thank for this opportunity to the entire team. And I would also like to add that uh, I'm here to represent women of my background and uh, all the women who actually trusted on me, confided on me, and then uh, selflessly shared their personal stories with me whenever I traveled remote parts of Nepal. Uh, coming back to your question, I would like to tag myself as a human geographer. I'm trained in uh, human geography with a focus on uh, gender and natural resource management. I started to my career in a, in a thematic area of migration, and then after I worked in several other themes, for example, local governance, and then peace and security, women in political, women political empowerment, and uh, uh, last five years I'm working in water governance. Well, what I've learned, you know, like I have worked in several themes, thematic area, different developing topics, but uh, gen gender and social inclusion was always central to all, all my research. And what I've learned, and I think we all cannot deny is that, you know, like without addressing these issues, we cannot uh, think of sustainable development or inclusive development. Yeah, thank you. I'll stop here. 
No, that's really helpful and great to know your background a bit. Uh, so same question to all, all our panelists before we crack on to a to different ones. So Khadija, you're looking uh, very ready to answer this question. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Ellie, and thank you for having me on the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. So I started my career as a field officer in, uh, in, a, in an agriculture project. And from there, I learned the issues of the community, especially the issues of the women farmers. And from there, I decided where uh, I, what I am going to do in my future career. So women empowerment and social inclusion was the path I have chosen for my career. And from then onwards, I'm working on women empowerment. I'm, uh, I'm the part of many women rights uh, networks in Pakistan. I work with different organizations like uh, uh, Sarhad Sport Work and UNDP. I work with uh, ADB projects on different capacities like uh, gender specialist and program manager channel. And I'm actively, actively working on women empowerment. So I'm a social scientist. Perfect. Um, the Kiwi, your turn. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm currently doing a PhD in agricultural economics, of which I think it's the right fit because I come from a rural background and I've got passion for agriculture. I work uh, at IMI as a researcher. When I came here, I felt like uh, working uh, for the water institution, it was out of my comfort zone. Of which is that it was a good thing because in my mind I thought that maybe agriculture was separate from water, but I realized that uh, what I mean agriculture is a largest consumer of water. Water is important for agriculture as much as agriculture is important for the food uh, food sector. So I think this kind of gave me a clear picture of the nexuses between those two sectors. So last year um, I was. I was appointed as a ministerial representative, which is kind of a highlight for me. Uh, a, a winter cereal trust for a winter cereal, cereal trust in South Africa. To me, that's a great uh, platform as a young researcher and as a PhD student, because it shows that my skills and expertise are recognized and valued. So I think that's an important validation for my growth, especially my career. Well, that you sound extremely busy and uh, a hugely impressive uh, CV as well. Um, so thank you for taking time out of all your <laughs> projects to, to speak today. Um, we have uh, a special guest, uh, I say guest, um, but we have Tando um, who is joining us. Uh, and I'll, I'll let her introduce herself because um, she's not an Emmy staff, but she's worked very closely with us. And I know she's got some... Uh, she's providing the perspective of uh, a, a wonderful, a talented woman in her own field, but who's also expressed interest in pursuing a science degree later in life. So I I'd like to hear her perspective, and it would be great if you could tell us a bit about your background and why you're, why you're here today, why, you're, why you wanted to join and speak with us. Uh, thank you very much, Ellie. I would like to Great everyone in the panel. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be the part of this panel today. Um, it's very much important to me uh, actually to join such um, a, a session for women in women in girls and girls in, in science. Actually, I started um, to work with communities over 10 years ago as a community facilitator. I was started working in the rural areas where I was born. Uh, I was working as a secretary for the community garden uh, under the supervision of the Department of Agriculture. From there, I joined the NGO called Suhang as a community facilitator, uh, actually, um, I'm in the field whereby I integrate the local people, uh, local communities, 
uh, with government, uh, also with the local uh, community stakeholders, also to help them to map the community uh, stakeholders. And then from there, that is where I started to learn more technical work uh, in, uh, in terms of water, especially when you connect water from the springs, from wells, to their community gardens all over um, uh, all in all provinces actually in South Africa uh, in South Africa is because um, mind you is not not all of us we are affording to have the the budget or funds to drill the borehole and so ever so I was trying to emphasize women and girls to do whatever they have next to them so that they can get water for irrigation. Uh, I participated in so many projects, uh, such as food security project with the Department of Agriculture, again in multiple use water services, whereby I met Imi uh, in the supervision of uh, Dr. Barbara van Kopen. That is where um, I learned uh, most of uh, research. When you work with the communities, you have to listen to, to them and then you collect their ideas, you shape the women's, and then I supported women to understand the gender equality. Because most of the time in terms of water, we understand that yes, uh, males, are leading in science also in terms of uh, decision making when it comes to water issues but uh, by the project uh, i used to work on we gave them an opportunity to have a voice because if there is a breakdown on the tape the first person who can able to realize that there is a breakdown is a woman or girl mind you in our research with imi uh, uh, <clears throat> our findings shows that um, the, the people who are using water uh, mostly between males and females are females because we are always at home. Uh, most of the time males, they went out to work in other provinces and then we, we go through the experiences. Even when we have our menstrual uh, days, we experience our menstrual days, we need more water. Again, I engage myself with our engineers uh, to learn more about the importance of uh, water quality. As I'm speaking now, I can collect water samples to the laboratory. I can interpret them. Um, I can interpret those water quality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And, and just before we jump onto the other questions, Tando, I, I just want to ask you one thing. I, I know that when you were introduced to me by Inga uh, uh, last week, um, it was mentioned that you were interested in maybe pursuing a science degree. And I think something that everyone on this call knows is that uh, it's very difficult uh, for women and well, girls particularly to enter um, or to feel like they have space in, this, in the world of STEM. Um, the, the percentage uh, of, of women and, and girls going into STEM subjects is still extraordinarily low. I think the UN gave a stat saying 2% of, of girls choose to study IT, 2%. So I'm interested just here very quickly, uh, did you want to go into science earlier or have you been inspired recently? I think you said you have been inspired, but do you feel like there is now space for you? Do you feel like the world has changed enough for you to confidently enter what has always been seen as a man's world? And I use that. In, in quote marks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Elim. Due to the experience I have working uh, in science uh, field, um, I am willing to enroll uh, the degree. Actually, I'm busy with the registration with uh, UNISA because while I was young, I wasn't having an opportunity to do science because where I was uh, schooling, there was no facilities for science. So now as I have experience, I wish to learn more uh, 
actually to get the degree and then I will carry on because I think it's a good fit for me because I can empower other young girls. Thank you. Thanks so much. That's really interesting to hear. Um, okay, I am going to uh, switch back to Maha uh, with, with a question. I mean, we, we, you touched on it very briefly, but uh, one thing I would like to know, um, is there a moment that you felt that you've made a particular impact to the country or the region you work in, um, but specifically to empower women and girls? So obviously you're extremely uh, talented in, in research and policy and but is there anything you've done in your career that has empowered women and girls that you'd like to share with us today? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is a really interesting question. Uh, in fact, uh, yes, uh, after finishing my PhD in 2017, uh, I dedicated really a good time and engaged uh, with many uh, CPOs and GOs in Jordan uh, and contributed uh, to localizing SDGs uh, through uh, mentoring up to 10 startups. Uh, and 20 young uh, entrepreneurs and uh, young researchers uh, who invented green solutions in Jordan. So uh, further, uh, I'm really proud that I'm promoting positive youth development uh, through uh, mentoring uh, up to 20 interns so far. Uh, that resulted in creating a 12 uh, youth environment uh, learning clubs across Jordan. Um, I feel happy actually when I see these uh, mentees uh, flourishing, developing their uh, career path in science and particularly in water. And uh, most of uh, these uh, interns uh, or, or uh, mentees were uh, uh, female. Um, I feel they, they get inspired by, uh, by my career path um, uh, being uh, maybe, uh, and closely like my, my family, uh, uh, that I was the first uh, uh, female uh, obtaining a PhD degree uh, in science. So that uh, really inspired a lot of uh, uh, girls around me and uh, receive a lot of calls. Uh, how did you do that? How did you achieve this? So uh, I feel happy when I, I contribute uh, back to my to my community. Thanks so much and, and I just want to ask you a follow-up question to that because I know Mark Smith also mentioned how important mentoring has been and I know it was mentioned in the previous um, session with Iri. What is it about mentoring uh, girls and also young women that you feel is particularly important and what, why is it so valuable? It is very important, actually, because some of them, um, some of them, they just need that to click that uh, you need to push that confident in, in them that you can do uh, nothing impossible. Uh, you have to do this. You have to consider that. So uh, they need just like uh, eye opening on a couple of things uh, for the career uh, and uh, particularly in science, because science and research, there is like a lot of protocols you have to follow, a lot of skills you have to develop. Uh, commitment, uh, a support for, from family needed. So it's a long journey. It's not an easy journey. So uh, just open their eyes about what's head, like what is heading them. Uh, this is very important uh, to get them uh, really ready, uh, to inspire them, to uh, make them feel that they can do it, uh, connecting them with uh, good models of, of uh, women who uh, were contributing globally, uh, regionally, nationally. So uh, this is very important for, uh, for uh, let's say, early researchers and girls who still like approaching their, uh, their path. Thank you very much. I, I'm also going to, uh, oops, sorry, just muted, muted myself mid-sentence. Um, I'm also going to ask the same question uh, to Gita, uh, if that's okay. Uh, if there's a particular moment in your career uh, that has uh, directly you felt has directly empowered women and girls uh, and why that was so important for you and also for the community thanks again for the question ellie i'm, I'm i hope i'm audible yes um ellie i think uh, at the personal level this question it's a bit tricky for me uh, for two reasons first uh, i think uh, like most of the women in my part of the world i'm yet to learn to claim my share of contribution to society and the community you know like okay what a woman of my background can contribute to the society we have never uh, given weight to that question right 
Second, it's also tricky because um, to measure the output of the research, specifically when we talk about social science research and when you are dealing with gender and social norms, it's very difficult, right? That's the second point. But uh, there are some explicit outcomes or moments uh, when I really felt proud of and, uh, you know, like I felt that, okay, through my research, I'm able to contribute something. Uh, I would like to share one of such moment, uh, if I have the permission. So uh, it was back in 2018 when uh, we had organized this town hall meeting dialogue and we had uh, uh, invited a range of stakeholders from uh, politicians, then elected representatives, local leaders, uh, media representatives and women and men farmers, right? And then uh, in that uh, town hall meeting, I presented my research from uh, Farvis Nepal, where I presented on how gender and social norms can have impact on decision-making spaces and benefits from water interventions projects, right? Um, and I presented a specific case study on uh, of a Dalit woman. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this word, uh, Dalit is considered a low caste group in Nepal and in South Asia, right? So that was a story of a Dalit woman. She was uh, uh, with a migrant husband and three young kids. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, her extended family member, he got married with a girl from higher caste and her extended family, they were ostracized from the community. And she was not allowed to join any of the community groups. What was the result? The result was she was forced to steal for the forest resources for her survival. She was forced to go far to fetch water to irrigate her vegetable farms. You know, this was not easy for a single young mother, right? With a migrant husband. And means if you see from individual well-being perspective, this was not good. If you we see it from water justice perspective, it was not good. Uh, so, you know, um, when I shared this story in the town hall meeting, uh, I found most of the stakeholders, there were 50 participants there, and they were in denial mode. You know, you know this cannot happen. So this is something which is uh, uh, history. Uh, and uh, to link this with uh, last year, we also did some interviews from, uh, from the same stakeholders from the same regions. And they were of the same opinion, you know, no, 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 caste discrimination is something history. Women in our part of the world, they are empowered, they are smart and they can speak, right? Coming back to the town hall meeting, everyone was in the denial mode. And then a woman stood up and she was a Dalit woman farmer, right? And I, I, I think it was not easy for her to stand up, especially when she was the minority in the group. You know, there were not many Dalits and she stood up and shared her own story and then verified my data. You know, it was kind of an emotional moment for me, but also I felt proud that, okay, our research in some ways are giving platform to the, the voice to the experts. Right. Yeah. So, you know, like these are not very big stories. These are very small stories, but I think these are very powerful incidences, which are very important for inclusive uh, water uh, development. Right. Uh, and this also shows, you know, why we need more women uh, in the research sector, how women can confine to another woman, how they feel easy to come, uh, easy to share their own personal stories with a woman researcher, which they may find difficult to share with a male researcher, maybe because of some local contextual gender and social norms, right? Uh, I would also like to link this to another uh, incident uh, a story, you know, uh, I, I'll be very brief. So I did another research uh, in, back in 2018 and 19 in gender in organizations, in water public organizations in Nepal. So in the, for that research, I interviewed uh, a range of women uh, employee who were employed in the water organizations. And they shared very interesting stories. They shared about gendered practices within organizations. You know, gendered practices in the form of jokes, which has been culturally accepted. It's a part of the organizational culture. You know, it has been internalized by the organization. It has been accepted by the individual, but it has negative effects on women employees. You know, like uh, it deprives of, the, of uh, their self-esteem, their confidence, and they are not able to raise women's issues and they cannot uh, con contribute effectively to water, uh, water decision making. So, uh, you know, like this, um, and to add, to add a layer to this, uh, this story, 
uh, when we talk about organizations, I think uh, IMI as an organization provides us uh, an interactive platform, you know, where we can interact with um, uh, non jesse researchers, you know, I think, and this space is very important to transform the uh, mindsets, you know, like wrong, wrong conceptualization of gender. Back in uh, 2016, we were in the central Nepal, just two more lines and uh, one more incident. Uh, and we were in the field and a male researcher, he took his camera out and he said, I want to photograph gender. And in his frame, we were three female researchers. Just imagine, right? Just imagine three female researchers and for him that was gender. Uh, I think it, it's like been three years now and I think his conceptualization of gender as a three woman has drastically changed from how to reflect or, on his own behaviors. You know, these are a few moments I think which I love to reflect back and uh, which uh, I'm proud of. Yeah, I would like to start here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can listen to you honestly. I think we should. I think we should petition for three hours power hour, because um, that was really fascinating. And actually, just a, so just a few things. I, I we do have the video working, but I just want to ask one follow up question to Khadija based on uh, uh, what you've just been talking about. Actually, uh, because Khadija, I know you're um, you know you're a gender specialist and you uh, you focus on gender analysis. Uh, so just this is going off uh, piste slightly. Um, but all the things that have just been raised by Gita, how can, this is about women and girls in science, but what we're, what we're hearing in these stories and what we've heard in story after story after story is that men, although often willing and keen to support, may inadvertently block initiatives or may not understand quite, uh, obviously not all men, um, hashtag. But I think it would be interesting to hear your perspective on how men can support women and girls in science too. Is it about letting women speak more? Is it about platforming? Is it about how, how in your experience, Khadija, how can men uh, support women and girls? Because clearly, when it's predominant men in senior positions, we do need to, uh, they do need to understand what we need also. Thank you, Ellie. And uh, from my field experience, when we work on gender equality, it's, uh, we need to understand that we cannot do it alone. Unless we engage with men and boys in achieving gender equality, it cannot be done. We can do it together. So uh, one of my field experience, I can share it with you. Uh, I was working with uh, rural communities and I was a uh, capacity building trainer uh, for the communities. Uh, I was arranging uh, leadership trainings for the uh, men and women of the area. So I uh, arranged a leadership training, residential leadership training for a men group. And that was, uh, training was conducted in the provincial capital. So we took men to that uh, provincial capital. After that training, uh, I organized a same training for the women. And I asked my field officers to uh, nominate women and uh, for that training. So, and I uh, also mentioned some uh, villages, so uh, nominate men, women from that area. So uh, one of the field officers said that uh, this area is very rigid and the people will not allow uh, women to come for the training for a res residential training uh, to a far flung area. So uh, I said, okay, I will visit with you and I will talk to their men. And uh, when I uh, visited that area, uh, one of the men from that village, he has attended that training with me. So when uh, we talked about the training and uh, allowing uh, women participation in the training, and then he, uh, he met with me and he said, oh, it's you who will conduct in that training. I said, yes, I will be with them. I will taking them. Uh, I will traveling traveling with them, and he said, "Oh, if it's you, uh, you are doing this uh, wonderful work, and if you can do it, our women can do it. So I will allow my sister to uh, participate in the uh, in the training, and I will also um, motivate other uh, men in my area uh, to allow their women to participate in the training." So I was very happy and I feel proud that, okay, what we are doing, we are uh, 
making some ch uh, change and there is some impact of the work we are doing so uh, this is how the engaging with men and boys is very important and crucial in achieving gender equality thank you so much um uh, for that for that response um i know we've got a few questions uh from in, in the q a and we've got 15 minutes left but we do have a video so uh, we're going to go to a short video break. So our panelists have a sip of water while we um, while we while we go to uh, the, the, the video now, and then we'll we'll pop back for the questions from the floor and and one or two final uh, questions from me. Um, and thanks so much for all your answers uh, so far. Um, Roseanne, do you want to? Uh, there we go. <laughs> People say I'm volatile. I've had to be there. I'm a message. I took no notice. I gave you the cold shoulder. Nothing's changed. I'm going to run the seconds. The more I try, the less you listen. So now that I've caught your attention, introduce myself. I am water and we need to talk. I know I've been unpredictable lately, but what do you expect? When things heat up, I get more intense. You can no longer depend on me to quench your thirst, nor to give the rain your crops need to grow. The lucky few will cope, yet many more will struggle. But don't be mistaken, if we work together, we can change course. If you develop smart solutions, I can go further. If you harness the power of the sun, I will help your fields to flourish. If you build circular systems, I won't go to waste. But this isn't just about technology. Planting trees holds back my surgeons. Well-managed wetlands keep me contained. And protecting groundwater helps me flow clean and freely. Yes, I am volatile, but if you take the time to understand me, if you bring me into the conversation, together we can adapt to climate change. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry if that was a bit jumpy, uh, but I'm sure you got the message of it of water being very important, which is of course why we're, why we're still here uh, talking about uh, women and girls in science and how, how we can, uh, Emmy and how we can support a, a water secure future. Um, I just want to uh, go to Bikiwi. Um, I have a question on uh, something a little personal. Um, I want to know, because obviously you've had such a, and you are having such a great career, is there anything you thought, I will never be able to do that when you started out? And how did you manage to do that? And how did you succeed? Tell me a little bit about a story associated with that. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Uh, I think there are so many times where I doubted my capabilities, where I thought I would never be able to do this. When I did my master's, actually I didn't apply the, pre the previous year, so when the semester started, my brother invited me to the university and asked on how, uh, what happened, uh, did you get space? And I told him that no, I was rejected. So he took me to, to the head of department and then we inquired about that. Uh, the head of department required my, my, my transcripts and everything, he took them. After three days, I actually gave me a form to apply again, of which I didn't apply, but I lied to my brother that I applied because I felt like I was done with school, you know, after having an undergraduate degree, I was ready to work. I just wanted to work so I can make my own money, buy a car, you know. When you are young, you think uh, everything is easy. You just work and have a car and have a house. You start a family. So I was accepted, accepted after my brother forced me to apply and they told me to come and write a competency test of which I did and I performed very well such that I got a bursary. 
because I performed well. And I was really surprised because I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. I told myself that I'm done with school. I actually want to work. But that kind of motivated me. And I man managed to see my capabilities that no, I know I'm capable of doing this. Let me just do my master's and I'll probably do my PhD. And I, I'm very glad to have a brother like that one who managed to push me into the right direction. And that's what I want to do, you know, encourage people who are around me, encourage the women, women and girls around me so that we push them to the right directions and they, they, they realize their capabilities. Because I believe that as long as you put your, your, your mind and your heart in whatsoever that you want to achieve, you definitely achieve it. That's really, that's really important. And obviously all down to your hard work as well as your brother pushing you, which is a really great story. Um, I, I want to bring in the questions from the floor now. So we've got, we've got one question, which is, I think is very interesting. And I'm just going to rephrase it slightly um, because I think it's, it's a really full question um, about female leadership. And of, of obviously in, in this, on this planet, the majority of, of CEOs are, are men, uh, not women. But what, what the question is asking is leadership about voice and about being loud and strong, like a, maybe the traditional image of a man, or is it more about a woman's inner ability and determination? So I think the question is, is really about how women, what, what's that, what makes a great women leader? What makes a great female leader? And I'd like to uh, go to, who do I want to go to? Maha, <laughs> can you answer this for me? Uh, this is very interesting and uh, still challenging a question, actually. What makes a, a, a female a leader or a woman a leader? Actually, that uh, should start from home. Uh, the way uh, that uh, she raised, uh, the, the voice that she raised at home, uh, equal opportunity with uh, uh, male uh, brothers uh, and the environment, how the environment would support her. Uh, so um, I guess this is where, where it starts. Uh, then definitely support ed education, uh, let her do her education, uh, travel. Uh, explore uh, different areas from the world uh, that will uh, support her to gain um, uh, and expose to other cultures, uh, to other, uh, 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 let's say, um, uh, uh, countries that will enrich her experience and definitely, uh, and uh, definitely if she had, uh, or if she will have uh, an equal opportunities at, at work and economic uh, support. So, um, uh, but uh, that should start from, from uh, home, uh, how you raise her, that she has the right uh, to ask about, that she has a voice to raise, uh, definitely with all respect to others, but uh, this is uh, how I see it. That's really interesting. Does anyone else on the panel want to come in on that? Because I, I'm interested to hear a few other voices on what makes a great female leader and how, how, can, we, uh, how can we compete <laughs> With, with the male dominance uh, that's in the world at the moment. Uh, Bikiwi, do you have any thoughts? Or Khadija? Oh, no, Khadija, sorry. My, yeah, Khadija, are you yeah, there? Uh, oh, you're there, great. Bikiwi, go on, go ahead. Okay, for me, I think it, it's about knowing your worth uh, and giving other people opportunities. Uh, don't be afraid to motivate other people. Uh, the people who are around you, just have a clear communication with them. It's not about how much you raise your voice, but it's how much you had, you know, when you're saying something. But make sure that you, you motivate the, the people who are around you and also encourage them. Thank you. And Tando, a non imi perspective, uh, what, what for you makes a, a great leader in your opinion and, and how and how can and how can women step up and be heard in your opinion okay thank you very much ellie uh, i think um i fully agree with my uh, partners who, when they said we have to motivate the women again when you work with them you also have to practice what you are saying in front of them so that they can be un encouraged that as um, 
Tando can do this, we can also do this. I would like also to share my short story uh, with my, one of my villages. I went there to deliver material. The material was delivered by the supplier. As a woman, there was a lot of men and few females. They asked me because they were not understanding exactly the specifications of the materials. They asked me, Tando, who is going to tell us what kind of a pipe is this one? I said to myself, they said, really? I said, yes. I started to demonstrate to them. That is whereby I realized that they enjoy to see someone talking also, uh, doing it practically. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and we have uh, five minutes left uh, and an awful lot of really great questions coming in from uh, the attendees. So. I want to just ask, I, I think what I'm going to have to do is uh, choose. Um, so what I want to ask is uh, Toby's question to uh, Khadija. Considering the barriers that have been faced by some of you, the panelists, he asks, do you think things are getting better? And are we on a good trajectory? Are we doing enough. Uh, and he points out very astutely that the majority of the welcoming remarks in today's marathon session have not so far been from women, which shows that we still have some way to go. So uh, Khadija, do you have any thoughts on are things getting better? And uh, then I'll do a, a quick wrap up. Thank you. Well, I, I would say yes, things are getting better. If, we, uh, if I see some years back, things were very different from now. We are discuss now discussing the issues that are some years back that were even not considered issues in our culture. So more women are coming in different fields. There were many fields that were not considered uh, suitable for women that are just men's to men. But now women are entering into different fields. Men, women, women are entering into different uh, non-conventional fields for women. So it's things are changing, yes. And uh, organizations like Amy and other, they, they have definitely a very uh, positive role in changing this. Thank you. And, and I lied, we've got time for one other question from the floor. So uh, I'm just- Can I add to this uh, Oh, of course question. you can, please do, yes. So I'll be very brief, Ellie. So I think as uh, other colleagues said, you know, things are improving and uh, uh, it's getting better, but I think uh, we also need very strong commitment at layers. Uh, there are things uh, which needs to improve yet, you know? And uh, adding this to one more point, you know, like uh, women are coming to decision making positions, but they are adjusting themselves. We are, uh, we are within the masculine leadership style and relating this to the previous question, I think we have to make an environment, a work culture where feminine leadership is accepted in, and valued. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask you a quick follow up? What, what do you what do you see? What do you mean when you say feminine leadership? When I say feminine leadership, I mean where, you know, like diverse needs are uh, addressed in the organization. You know, we work in an organization now, organization culture, most of the organization cultures are, you know, like it is meeting men's need, you know. Uh, a typical uh, man who works outside the home, right? But female needs, it's, it's diverse, you know? And there are, even within female, there is diversity, right? There is not one single category of women. So I think when we try to bring all these things together and when we try as an organization, when we try to address these needs, that makes an inclusive culture. Thank you so much. And I think uh, we do need to wrap up now. So uh, can I just say my, my huge thanks to Maha, Gita, Bikiwi, Khadija and Tando for all your extraordinary and insightful comments and thoughts and, uh, and thinking about how we can make change because obviously it's extremely necessary. Um, so thanks ever so much. And 
I know Inga has posted some uh, a link in the chat if you want to find out more about WIRES uh, and get involved. Um, and the, the wonderful questions that I haven't had a chance to answer, hopefully our panelists can uh, maybe look in the Q&A and, and respond to those individually. I know that that would be very appreciated. So thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, uh, Fiona, thank you very much, everyone. And Fiona, over to you. Thanks so much, Ellie. Th thanks to you. Thanks to Khadija, Maha, uh, Bekikwe, Gita, Tando, Ellie, Mark, and also to Razi, Karen, Inga, Ellie and Sandy. A lot of people to thank, but what a marvellous session. I know I've said it before, but um, I only wish we had more time. Every single one of these sessions just makes me want to do this all over again and give, uh, give the, the power hour, extend the power hour to more than an hour. Uh, but we do truly appreciate your comments and, and your commitments and the time that you've taken to be with us today. I know that many of you, as Ellie has said, many of you online may have questions we couldn't fit in, but don't worry. This is the start of interesting discussions, enjoyable, inspiring, enlightening and, and interesting discussions. And they're to be continued. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to your IMI colleagues to continue the conversations after today's event. And on that note, as time is advancing, it's time to, to move to ICRSAT. 